Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto Katoa. Now my Harimai, a very warm welcome to our Good Friday service. Um, say straight away, um, no my Harimai, welcome all of our online community who are joining us as well for this. Truly is a momentous day in the Christian calendar and a world changing moment for the whole of humanity. The events of Good Friday. Can I just say straight away, you'll notice that there's a sprig of rosemary. Um, We'd like you to sort of just keep that close because we will be using that and we'll explain how as the service progresses. But let me begin by just setting the scene because I think it's very important that we do. By the way, if you're just visiting St George's and I've just met a couple who have come for the first time, Uh, It's wonderful to have you with us. I hope that this is a real time, a sacred time, as we contemplate the events of Good Friday. But it's good to set the scene by just uh, reminding ourselves of the journey. Because we here at St George's have been on a six-week journey of Lent. And of course, this is the traditional Christian journey, and it's based on the deeply testing 40 days and 40 nights that, uh, nights that Jesus experienced in the desert wilderness. And that's the image that we've had at the front of our church all the way through this journey. Jesus wrestling with the presence and the voice of the accuser and the tempter. And last Palm Sunday, we had a joyous Sunday, but I described Jesus' very very provocative entry into Jerusalem on a donkey as a collision that was always going to happen because it's the clash of two kingdom ways, two completely different ways of what it means to be and live humanity. The way of the donkey versus the way of the war horse. The way of peace versus the way of fear and coercive power. The way of the servant heart versus the way of the self serving heart. Today is the culmination and the consequence of this clash. All the corrupt self-serving powers and dominions that have opposed Jesus, undermined Jesus and threatened Jesus now find a way to do what they've always wanted to do, to silence Jesus. I also said on Sunday that all of this reveals a defining characteristic in Jesus Christ that gives the world the saving, redeeming power of the cross. And the defining characteristic is Jesus' courage. And without this staggering courage, motivated by the force of sacrificial love, there would be no cross and no release for humanity from the bondage of our sin and all that holds us captive. So today, through scripture, image and music, we're going to journey with Jesus to the cross. And there will be less emphasis on words, more emphasis on engaging with our senses to let the power of the cross and this central story of our faith speak for itself. And you can see around the church we've got um, stations of the cross for you to engage with. For every character who is part of the cross, there is a journey of raw emotion, raw emotion. And through these stations that we've set up, there will be space and opportunity for all of you in the way that you feel comfortable to engage with your own raw emotions on this day. So Jeremy will unpack with a a short reflection all of these stations a little later. But we do pray that these stations are a time for you to bring all of the emotions you may be carrying to the foot of the cross on this sacred occasion. And uh, there will also be an opportunity, opportunity to take part of an anointing with oil, very much as a, a healing balm for your soul. And as I said, you're invited to participate uh, in any way that feels comfortable and helpful to you. So that's the setting of the scene. So let's begin this journey together, this deeply profound day, with a time of sacred silence.
Let us pray these words together on the screen. We gather at the beginning of this holy day to consider the journey towards the cross, which calls us on not in shame, not in fear, but more deeply into that costly journey toward life. In that journey, there is both joy and suffering. In Jesus Christ, you, O God, are not separated from this journey. On this holy day, we come with open hearts to hear what your guiding spirit is saying. So now as we continue our journey of the cross, we contemplate through image and music the journey of Jesus to the cross. And the music is the Lord's Prayer sang in Aramaic, the language of Jesus Christ. Once 
individual lives, but also as the body of Christ. Pray these words together. We are often slow to follow the example of Christ. Lord, have mercy. We often fail to be known as Christ's disciples. Christ, have mercy. We often fail to walk the way of the cross. Lord, have mercy. And know that God forgives you. So forgive others, forgive yourselves, and through Christ on the cross, God has put away all of our sin, and we can all approach our God in peace. Amen. Please take our seat as Warren comes to bring our first of our Good Friday readings. Thank you. First reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 26, verses 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be anguished and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. <coughs> then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he found them again sleeping, 
because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come, and the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. you'd like to get your sprig of rosemary, we're just going to have an opportunity now for some time to contemplate those anguished words of Jesus, that my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Very powerful words. Could we have the next slide, please? Rosemary is often used at funerals as a symbol of our sorrow and our sadness. So we invite you to take a moment just to crush your sprig of rosemary and release its fragrance. And let that bring to mind a sorrow you might be carrying, a time, a feeling of anguish that you may have at this moment. And let this fragrance and be a time of a prayerful healing. So while you're doing that, we're going to play two songs. And they very much sing of Jesus's time of anguish and his very human desire to just want to know the company of his own friends. So we'll play as you spend time. Stay with me. Remain here with me. Watch and pray.
continue the journey to the cross with a story told through video. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers, with its commander and the Jewish officials, arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple were following Jesus. Because this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard, but Peter had to wait outside at the door. The other disciple, who was known to the high priest, came back, spoke to the servant girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I am not. It was cold, and the servants and officials stood round a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter also was standing with them, warming himself. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in synagogues or at the temple, where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? 
Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So as Jeremy comes to extinguish our second candle, as a symbol of the, the extinguishing of Jesus' life, could I invite you to stand? We're going to sing one of the most beautiful hymns that have been inspired by the cross. And it contains the line that really captures the cross in one sentence. Love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. So shall we stand and sing, My song is love unknown. My song is love unknown. My Savior's love to me. Love to the loveless shown. Jesus is sentenced to death. Second reading is the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 28 to chapter 19, verse 16. Jesus before Pilate. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid the ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated what kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom belonged to this world, 
my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? Jesus is sentenced to death. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him. But you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then he handed them, him over to them to be crucified. Thank you, Ruth. In a moment, Jeremy is going to come and give a short reflection on our stations of the cross. But as a way of preparation, could I just invite you to stand and we'll sing one more Easter hymn.
Could I just ask that you look at the very front of the church at those two images? Jesus at the beginning of his journey in the desert wilderness and then in front of it is the cross. And that was his journey on the 40 days and the 40 nights from the wilderness to the cross. So let's sing these words together. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they nailed him to the tree? Were you there when they pierced him in the sun? Were you there? John 19 verses 16 to 30. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Judeans. Many of the Judeans read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Judeans said to Pilate, Do not write, King of the Judeans, but this man said, I am King of the Judeans. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And this is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother 
and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of fear of the Judeans, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial customs of the Judeans. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Well, good morning. It feels like the world is standing on a precipice. And even if the only thing we were facing right now were the various environmental crises, things would seem hard enough. And then we add to the mix the increasing potential of escalation of various deeply troubling conflicts around our world. The way of the world seems to be heaving. As we have said before here, many times at St. George's, humanity's attempt to go it alone without God seems to be fraying at the seams. And it's no wonder then that many of us feel in the sense of a dislocation from a bigger story. We feel anxious, hopeless, powerless, we might feel angry or a sense of despair. This morning we enter into all of these feelings and emotions, all of these experiences, and to bring everything that we are carrying, everything that is weighing upon us to the cross of Christ, to the story of Good Friday. To find and locate ourselves and these experiences within the story. And so this morning we do not rush to the empty tomb of Easter Sunday. Rather, like Mary, the three Marys and John, we linger at the cross and bring everything we are feeling before him. As Josh mentioned last Sunday, he explored the collision course between the old story the story of power and control, and the new story, the kingdom story, the Jesus way, exemplified by the Beatitudes. Today it appears that the way of power, of control, of force has swallowed up the Jesus way, has falsified Jesus' Beatitudes claims that the truly blessed are the mourners, the poor and the powerless, the hungry and the merciful, the peaceful and the pure. The logic of Jesus' Jesus's way doesn't make sense 
within the framework of this old story. And it seems that the old story has completely humiliated the new story. Perhaps it appears that this is the logical conclusion after all. How can you face down power and force with these values that are behind us here, behind me? Jesus and all he represented, his kingdom vision has been humiliated, shamed, mocked, exposed. And don't be fooled by all our artistic representations of the cross. There was no discretion for Jesus. And he died a slave's death. Shameful for the Jewish mind, the Greek mind, the Roman mind. It is uncomprehensible. The kingdom story that Jesus proclaimed therefore must have been just too good to be true. And all this is captured, I think, rather beautifully in this sculpture of Jesus being taken down off the cross by these two men, I'm assuming Joseph and, Nicode- Joseph, uh, Joseph and Nicodemus. And this is a focal image for our reflection this morning. To me, it captures the sense of powerlessness we might feel in the face of our world or personal situations. It captures a sense of a story dislocated and broken. We can only wonder what these two minor characters in the Gospels, Joseph and Nicodemus, are going through. This is not how it was meant to end. What about the other disciples? Where are they in the story? We've heard of Mary, her sister, Mary of Magdala, and John the Apostle. But what about the others? I wonder where they were. Were they watching from a distance? Their hope of a Messiah An anointed liberator king has now vanished. They are dislocated from the story that they had been inhabiting for the last few years, that they had given up everything for. Where are you in the story, I wonder? Where are they feeling? What are you feeling? Grief and despair? A sense of being alone in the world, lost and adrift without their rabbi, their teacher, their master, their lord. Absolutely. Anger? All sorts of anger, no doubt. Anger at the way things are, at the systems, that this old story. Anger at the political and religious leaders, Judean and Roman. Anger at Jesus? Perhaps, how could you? We thought... Anger at God for letting it happen this way? Where are you angry? Perhaps they felt hopeless and powerless. What are we to do now? And of course, when we later see them hiding in the upper room, we know that they felt anxiety and fear for the future. They had given up so much, but for what? So I wonder this morning where you are feeling these emotions. Are you feeling a sense of dislocation from a bigger story of hope? Perhaps you look at the world and struggle to have hope for your future, your own, or perhaps for your children or grandchildren. Maybe it is a personal sense of dislocation. You have lost someone or something that made sense of life for you. Maybe a job that defined a sense of worth and purpose. Perhaps a struggle, a health struggle that stops you from living into the story that you thought you would have. In the face of these, what are you feeling? A mix of anger, hopelessness and powerlessness, grief, despair, sadness. Are you carrying any fear or anxiety about these things? And so we're just going to come to a time of providing space to enter into these feelings, to explore them and to bring them to Jesus this Good Friday. 
And so we have, as we've already experienced, the rosemary. And perhaps maybe if it's sadness, I mean, you might want to select a bunch of these but or focus just on one that you feel resonates mostly with you. But we have rosemary. And I want to invite you again to just, if sadness is what you're car- carrying, to crush and to smell, to savour that aroma. And if you are able, there is a beautiful icon here by uh, Libby Brookbanks come and bring the rosemary there's a few bottles and i'm reminded of the passage that that god stores up our tears in bottles and so we bring our sadness gaze upon the icon and bring your sadness to christ what are you mourning where are you feeling lonely bring all that perhaps it's fear or anxiety and so we have a couple of stations one here and one at the back where we can light candles and pray for peace. Maybe you are fe- feeling anger or and or powerlessness, and we have a basket up here of galvanized nails, and these can work two ways. Perhaps they are a symbol of your anger that you are feeling and wanting to drive through something, drive into something, or perhaps you are feeling pinned by something. You are feeling helpless and powerlessness, and the nail itself is a symbol of your weakness, of your brokenness, of you feeling pinned to a cross and unable to do anything about it. And I invite you to bring those to the foot of the cross. Perhaps you're feeling a sense of dislocation and it's just this big picture of what's going on in the world or in our life. And I would invite you to come and we'll move the candles and gather around the sculpture. You can touch it, you won't break it. (laughs) What do you notice? Look at Jesus' back, his face, his wrists, the, the limpness of his body, the struggle of these two men to lower him off the cross. How does it speak to you and to your sense of dislocation or despair? And after we've done, you've explored what you need to explore, Sandy and Stan will be available up here with anointing oil. And we will come and we will, once we have brought all of our feelings, we come for anointing and we recognize that Christ is with us in our pain and suffering and we receive the anointing of healing. I would just like to add that if uh, mobility is an issue, I myself and Stan, I think, and and maybe Sandy, uh, will will float around and will bring to you any, if you want a nail, we can bring it to you. If you want anointing where you are, we can bring that uh, to you. And so now we're just going to play some music, and this is the time now uh, where I invite you to... um, to get up, to move around, to engage with the space as you will. If you would like to remain seated and reflect and listen, that is also fine. Uh, So again, we've got grief over here. We have the candles of peace for our fears and anxieties here and at the back. The, uh, The sculpture, one last thing, we also have at the altar here, the communion table, bits of paper, where we can write any prayers, write down any fears, anxieties, sadnesses, and also bring them up to the high altar. I think I've covered all the bases. So we'll play some music, and I invite you to move amongst the space. Bless you.
Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you
We're drawing all of this together, and thank you so much. It's been very, very precious and very sacred just to be together and have this opportunity for space. So let's let's stand and sing the most classic of all classic Easter hymns when we survey the wondrous cross. Let's stand, please.
Take a seat, everybody. We'll just conclude all of this with a a time of prayer. Jeremy will lead us, and then we'll sing our final hymn. Lord, we lift up to you all of these things that we have reflected this morning, our sense of dislocation, our anxieties and fears, our griefs, our loneliness, our despair, our anger, our hopelessness and our powerlessness, all of those that we have called to mind or written on paper and even those that we we do not even we cannot even bring ourselves to to really look at to utter to name even in our hearts we we bring the unnamed to you as well and we enter into the story but we know that this is not the end of the story but we let we we remain here because we know that you Jesus are with us in all of these experiences That you, like water, always go to the lowest place, the place that all others avoid, bringing your life along the way. And so we pray together. Crucified Saviour, naked God, you hang humiliated and powerless Grieving we dare to hope, as we wait at the cross with your mother and your friend. Hear this prayer for your love's sake. Amen. 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 Thank you, Craig. Let's stand one more time, sing these words that tell the whole story. And if we could, when we finished, could we leave the church as the people who gathered on that day of the cross would have done, probably with a sense of silence and wondering. So if we could leave after this song in silence. Thank you. Let's stand and sing. From heaven you came, helpless faith. Entered our world, your glory. but to serve and give your life that we might live this is our God the servant king he calls us now to follow him to bring our lives as a day
So people of God, go in peace. We go in the name of Christ that we might be made.